What do you think? Should we get started? Yeah, might as well. All right. Chris, did you want to add anything before we get going? Or? All good. No, I just, I want to make sure you all can hear me. <laughs> Sorry, I meant Chris A. <laughs> oh, yeah? Too many Chris's. <laughs> okay, we're good. Okay. Right. Uh, yeah, so uh, without further ado, uh, in that case, let's hand over to Chris Nova and Michael Ducey for the Falco Incubation Review. Okay, I'm going to look at slides on my end, so I'll just let folks know when to bump to the next slide. Um, but yeah, thanks for, for letting us propose a, a proposal to move to incubation today. So uh, what we want to go over is just give folks a quick overview of what is Falco and the problems we're trying to solve, um, in case you're not familiar with it or in case you just want a brief update. Then we're going to go over some metrics that Ducey put together for us, talk about uh, how far we've come since last year when we did this, talk about folks who are integrating with Falco, that's building out software that is using Falco, and then, of course, folks who are using Falco as it stands uh, in just its vanilla form. Talk about our roadmap for the upcoming 12 months, and then talk about why uh, we desperately need to, to move to incubation and why we think we deserve it. Um, okay, next slide. Okay, so what is Falco? So I think sort of the, uh, the goal that we've agreed upon in our open source community is we're trying to solve cloud native runtime security. This is security for any cloud native uh, software and we want to do it at runtime, which is drastically different than some of the other solutions that are available today as we're doing this essentially as a, as a daemon over time. So we're focusing on Kubernetes intrusion and anomaly detection. And we want to integrate with a wide variety of services for alert collection and correlation. So brief history of Falco. We joined the Sandbox in October of last year. Big shout out to Brian and Quentin for helping us get into Sandbox. And of course, the project was started out of Sysdig in May of 2016. So we've been around the block a few times and we've been iterating on the project for a number of years now. Okay, next slide. I think this is a DC slide. Michael, you there? Yeah. Yeah, says oh, his, his zoom dropped. Yeah. Let's, let's see if we can't get him to rejoin. Okay, sorry about that. Can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Can you hear me? Okay, sorry about that. It's bad timing, right? It just happens right at the beginning of the call, right around when it happens. So anyway, uh, so let's talk about how Falco works. So um, one of our key things is that we take data from the Linux kernel. We do that either via um, a kernel module or an ABPF probe. And essentially, this is a stream of all the system calls that are going through the hosts that are running the container or uh, the nodes in the case of Kubernetes. We also take all of the audit log data from the Kubernetes audit log um, API. And all of that is sent through Sysdig processing libraries. And these are OSS libraries that we borrow from our companion project, uh, Sysdig. It's all open source. Um, but these, these are the main libraries that we borrow from that project. As part of that, then, we have a rule set that's applied, and that rule set uh, basically is applied to this event stream that's coming from the orchestrator and from the underlying nodes kernels. And that event stream basically allows us to check for things like um, is a container opening outbound connections to the internet? Uh, is all of a sudden my Node.js container starting to run other processes other than nodes? And things like that. When we detect these suspicious events, we send it off into the alerting engine, and then the alerting engine will forward it into one of those destinations. Uh, one of the things that we did do uh, over the course of Sandbox is add in new destinations. Uh, we don't want to get into the business of kind of doing data processing or false positive detection and all of those sorts of things. We're kind of more of what we want to do is be a generic sensor that focuses on providing a really good data stream, and then that data stream is then processed uh, in some other third-party system. So what we, we've been trying to focus on is getting the data out of Sysdig and having kind of generic interfaces to push that data stream into something else. 
Uh, next slide. And this is uh, an example reference architecture. Uh, it's, it's something that we actually published ourselves, uh, but we see end users picking it up and using it. Uh, and we have this example reference architecture built out for uh, Google, where we use Google PubSub and Google Functions. And then we also have a generic one that's using CNCF projects, so it uses NATS. Uh, and then in the case of the serverless functions, it uses Kubeless. Um, but basically what happens here is Falco detects something abnormal. We push it off into the PubSub service, in this case, Amazon SMS. And then you can have Lambdas fire to do different actions. So it can enhance the event, which is one of our end user uh, that we're going to talk about use cases that they do. Uh, you can actually have the Lambda take action and kill the offending container or kill the offending pod, isolate it with network policy, uh, other things like that as well, so that you can begin to do your process of incident response and automating that process of incident response uh, as well. Next slide. Okay, so on this slide, we wanted to focus on the community as well as folks from the SysDig side of things on uh, how we're structuring the project. Uh, and the first thing we wanted to do is we wanted to give a huge shout out to uh, five particular community members who have stepped up over the past year and have taken complete ownership of small sub projects and subsystems of the Thaco ecosystem. Uh, the first one, Thomas, he's probably the most active maintainer who's out of SysDig that we see in the community. Leonardo Grasso recently published the Prometheus Exporter, which is a way of plugging Thaco into Prometheus. We have Luke Perkins, Yokosha, and Rajiv, all of which have uh, taken ownership of various projects in the ecosystem. And then on the right side, you can see the core Falco team, which is a newly curated team sponsored by Sysdig, which is myself, Michael Ducey, uh, and then Leonardo and Lorenzo and Loris Diosani as well. Also, we wanted to highlight Mark Stem for all the work he's done over the past few years for bringing uh, Falco where it is today. Next slide. Uh, so we've seen uh, great growth. Um, I, one thing I want to say is working with the CNCF has been uh, really great. They've provided a lot of support. Uh, and I think um, the marketing support, the minimal marketing support that they've even helped um, sh shines light to the project and it brings in a lot of external people. So uh, I definitely want to um, speak to the fact that Sandbox has helped us tremendously uh, and really has increased our momentum. Uh, which is one of the reasons why we want to have this conversation about going to incubation is to keep that momentum going. But you can see some numbers here. One thing I want to point out is uh, we definitely have increased the number of external committers, uh, other people contributing to the project. One area of improvement there, though, is that we need external committers that are working on larger things. And that's one of the reasons why we have um, those other kind of sub projects, I would call them, like Falco Sidekick and the Prometheus Exporter and Client Go is that we can start pulling more people into the community to work on these kind of sub-projects and they don't necessarily have to work on the core Falco engine, which is written in C++, which is a little bit of a barrier entry to some people in the community. Um, another interesting one that I'll point out is that we're 70% on our way to passing for the CII progress. Uh, we, we've started to try and get ahead of some of the things that we need to do uh, for incubation. And the CII progress was definitely something that uh, we were we were looking at trying to uh, progress along. Uh, next slide. We do maintain our own Slack, and this shared with the Sysdig OSS project. Um, we're looking at moving that over into the CNCF Slack. Uh, but one thing I like about this slide uh, that I'll just highlight uh is that there's much more participation on a daily and a, and a weekly basis much much more people are active in the channel post sandbox than they were pre-sandbox uh and uh, we see that of course on our github repositories as well and a lot more activity and a lot more contributions but we also see it uh in the in the online way through slack as well uh next slide and then uh downloads um we've seen great momentum in the increase in downloads. These numbers have kind of been fluctuating as I've been learning how to use Amazon Athena uh, and update those uh, download numbers from the RPMs or Debian packages. Um, I, I, the numbers, um, the growth has been really good in this area. One thing that we wanted to try and figure out if we could highlight in this slide is, are people using Falco more 
from a container perspective or if they're installing it via Debian or RPM packages. Uh, and that kind of gives us an idea of the use case, whether if people are installing directly on the node, whether if they're even using Falco in a container environment at all. Because um, that's one of the challenges that we have right now is we're trying to balance between do we go full on Kubernetes and containers, which has kind of been our path, while we have some end users who are wanting to use this as a, as a generic host intrusion detection system, um, not in a Kubernetes environment. So that's one of the things that we're trying to balance between. Uh, next slide. Cool. So this one is me. So a big part of the work that I've been focusing on since recently joining Sysdig two months ago is trying to move our decision making process completely to open source and being as hygienic as possible about how we're calling the shots in Falco and how we're pushing all of our work that we're generating through the open source process that we're continually iterating over and trying to improve and make as friendly and uh, as easy to contribute as possible. So a big part of this has been making decisions in the open. So every decision that we're making, whether it's technical or process driven, we're recording, we're documenting, we're being very good about how we're, um, we're chartering this through what the uh, ecosystem that we're building. Furthermore, we've implement, implemented Prowl um, for all of our repositories, or rather all of our major ones that we're currently actively developing on. And this has been instrumental in how we're managing uh, contributions to the project and keeping track of not only our issues, but our roadmap as well. Uh, and last but not least, we've been working with Chris A over at the CNCF uh, on how we want to start to migrate uh, about a thousand users from our current Slack channel over to the CNCF uh, official Slack so we can start contributing even more so in the open. So just some uh, process clerical items that we've been focusing on over the past 45 days. Uh, next slide. Uh, next slide. We're just going to go over the sandbox pro progress here. So here's some items that we've shipped since sandbox. So this is a year ago and Ducey, keep me honest here because you've been much more involved in the process than I have, but I just wanted to highlight a few uh, a few ones here. Probably the most instrumental one here is eBPF support. So this is, uh, this is solving the problem of folks who don't necessarily want to load a custom kernel module into their kernel. So we're able to pull our kernel metrics from the kernel um, using the eBPF protocol instead of having to load a kernel module. So this has been a very uh, exciting part of the work that we're doing in that stream. Uh, we also hooked up uh, the Kubernetes audit engine to Falco. So we're now able to start enriching uh, what would otherwise be just regular kernel metrics, but with Kubernetes meta information, as well as the Kubernetes audit, audit stream. Uh, here you can see that we've, we've got a number of other uh, features that we've been working on, and these are, were all highlighted in the original roadmap uh, that we presented last year. So exciting progress for the team. And again, just wanted to give a shout out to everyone who's been a, a part of making this whole thing happen. Uh, so good job to everyone. And, upstream. Uh, next slide. Yeah, and um, when we went into the sandbox, we laid out a roadmap in our proposal. Um, this is a sampling of that roadmap. Uh, and then in, in Teal are the things that we promised in that roadmap and the things that we have shipped. Um, what I like about this is that it highlights that we have, you know, the engine of the project going, we can define a roadmap, we can uh, ship features uh, from that roadmap um, and we're able to have some sort of a process that we're following to actually have releases that matter um, with useful features for end users. Uh, next slide. And you can just go on to the next slide. There we go. Chris? Great. Um, yep. So uh, here's some integrations that we've been focusing on, uh, both pre-sandbox and post-sandbox. As you can see here, we've grown uh, exponentially, and we've been able to uh, work with various uh, projects in the in the ecosystem, such as Prometheus, Elasticsearch, um, as well as Splunk. That's another one that we see commonly for our end users. And I think Ducey is going to go into a little bit more detail for some of the, the users that we wanted to highlight here, but this is just gives you a good overview of where we were versus where we are now and the progress that we've been able to make over the past 12 years, both for the features that we've been shipping as well as the folks who are currently integrating with and using Falco. Yeah, and I'll just Next caveat slide. these integrations. Uh, I put this in the proposal as well, but not all integrations are created equal. Uh, some of these are where we're, we've written documentation or blog posts where we show you how to get uh, data, Falco data into one of these tools. 
some of these are things where we've actually incorporated code directly into the Falco engine, like uh, container D and cryo. We actually had to make core, core changes to the Falco code itself. Um, so um, each one of these are, are kind of a little bit of a different integration, and the amount of work and effort that went into each one is going to be varied based upon the integration itself. Next slide, Amy. Um, one interesting one that we saw is, so there's one thing to have, um, you know, end users using your tool or your project. Um, what we have seen is that a couple companies have actually embedded Falco into products that they're offering. One of them is a company called Altron who does IT consulting and they've created a secure cloud native fabric. Um, and they've incorporated this or they've incorporated Falco in to act as uh, runtime compliance and runtime security. They focus on telco workloads as well, so uh, next generation 5G workloads and things like that. Uh, they also actually incorporate a lot of open source as well into this platform. So can you go to the next slide, Amy? Uh, so they're incorporating things like Clear and Encore, Kubernetes, KubeBench, um, OSSEC, Istio, uh, and a number of other projects as well to kind of create this uh, um, this whole secure cloud native fabric uh, and including the container runtime, the cloud native stack and everything like that as well. So I find it interesting that how uh, people are kind of taking um, the cloud native landscape and building building products around it. Uh, next slide, Amy. And then another one is Sumo Logic, which uh, is offering up um, a container intelligence platform uh, as part of that container intelligence platform, they integrate in Prometheus, FluentD, FluentBit, uh, and Falco. Uh, and then they have applications that have uh, pre-canned dashboards for you so that you can actually pull all those metrics and data uh, out of your Kubernetes cluster uh, and then have a holistic view around monitoring and security uh, as well. Uh, next slide. And uh, so for end users, um, end users have been a little bit of a challenge for us for people to go on the record. And I think mainly that's just because people don't want to expose their security tools. Um, but of these, um, of these companies, the interesting thing is the similar theme is that all of them have compliance challenges. And in, in their compliance challenges, they're using Falco to meet that compliance requirement of having a host intrusion detection system installed in their Kubernetes cluster. Uh, a couple of these are healthcare use cases. Uh, a couple of these are government, or one of these is government. Uh, then um, industrial control is site machine, and then Shopify, of course, is PCI compliance, and then frame.io, which we'll talk about here. On the next slide is uh, movie, movie studio compliance, which I didn't realize movie studios had their own compliance framework, but apparently they do. Um, so frame.io is a a SaaS-based video review company. Um, they use Falco as an intrusion detection system, and they have a really interesting use case. Uh, I won't walk through this slide because everyone can read themselves. Um, but on the next slide is actually what's interesting is actually looking at their architecture. Amy, can you go to the next slide? Thank you. Um, so what they do is they take uh, Falco events and they publish it uh, through Amazon CloudWatch logs and then that pushes it off into AWS Lambda. And then what they do with AWS Lambda is that uh, that function actually will then go and query their environment, query their AWS environment, and enhance the Falco event with things like the VPC that the instance was running in uh, and other information as well. And then that Lambda actually forwards that event into several different locations. It puts it into uh, Amazon's event processing engine, it puts it into S3 so that you store the raw event for long-term storage uh, and other processing uh, as well. And then eventually it ends up into Elasticsearch where they can actually uh, see the event in Kibana. Uh, they have gave a presentation at Usenix about this event stream. In that presentation, they don't mention Falco, but it does give you a good idea of the architecture behind um, uh, behind that Falco event and how it gets processed and how it gets enhanced. Uh, with more metadata. Next slide. Um, Booz Allen Hamilton is another one of our end users. Um, they basically offer up a platform to developers uh, and offer up what they call pipelines as a service 
to where any developer can go and get a, uh, a new pipeline. And as part of that, they incorporate security best practices in that pipeline. So it's kind of a repeatable process for developers, making sure that they can embed security uh, very from, from the development start into their processes. Uh, and then what they do is, um, uh, as the container is actually running in production, they have software rules that are actually watching to make sure that the uh, container is not violating any policy that they had put in place earlier in their development cycle. So they check, and then once they actually deploy, they check again by using Falco. And they're giving a talk at KubeCon uh, North America this year as well. And Frame.io is also giving a talk uh, with us as well. And then Shopify, um, Shopify of course, uh, major retailer, um, and they use Falco uh, as part of their host uh, and network intrusion detection system. Uh, once again, they forward the event off in something like Splunk, and then they use Splunk to actually go and slice the data uh, and actually look at what's ha actually happening in their Kubernetes cluster as well. All of these are in our adopters.md file. Um, so if you're looking for those references, uh, they're in the adopters.md. And one thing that I'll point out about the adopters.md file is that if you ever thought it was hard to get end users to go on the record, probably the easiest thing you can do, and it's, it's such a simple thing, is put that adopters.md file out there and ask people to commit to it. And funny, they will commit to it. Uh, so it's good to see open source communities working. Uh, next. Thank you. And I think this is Chris. Hey, yeah, sorry, I was uh, texting someone. Um, okay, so talking a little bit about our future roadmap here, and this is kind of like what we're planning for the for the next quarter, all the way up until uh, this time next year. Uh, so we want to look at reevaluating how we're handling our events coming up from the kernel via the ring buffer. So we have uh, our resident C++ expert in PhD, Loris, who's going to be helping to spearhead that effort. Uh, and that's going to be doing working on performance improvements and uh, looking at how we're solving dropped events that are coming out of the kernel. Uh, we also want to improve the Prometheus exporter. So this is written in Go, and this has been monumental in how we're driving contributions to Falco and getting folks involved who no aren't necessarily uh, the best C++ engineers. So again, just pushing the Falco metrics to Prometheus. Um, right now we have mutually TLS encrypted uh, gRPC support for Falco outputs. We want to look at broadening that to building an entire API out for Falco so that other folks, including folks in the Kubernetes ecosystem, can start vendoring Falco and using it in different ways, which segues into our next goal. Uh, starting to look at playing with ideas about how we can start to secure Kubernetes by default with Falco. Uh, we're still in the process of sort of coming up with ideas of how we want to start proposing this to the community, but we've been looking at uh, ideas of integrating with COPS, Cubeadmin, Cubicorn, and other infrastructure management tools. Uh, and so far, the folks that we've talked to have been very supportive of, of this ambition of figuring out a good, insane way to uh, secure Kubernetes by default. Uh, Falco CTL, Falco Octal, Falco Cuddle, whatever, you, however you want to call it. Uh, basically, the administrative and operation style management tools for Falco. Again, written in Go, so we could drive more contributions there. Uh, we're looking at building out a what we're calling a cloud native security hub. So sort of imagine this as uh, Helm charts, but for Falco rules and policy. So how do we start defining what rules and uh, what policy we care about as a security ecosystem, and how do we start sharing and versioning these rules over time? Um, and last but not least, we've been working with folks over um, on the Aqua side of things with developing a uh, what we call RPI or runtime policy interface. I encourage everyone here to go take a look at that. We would love your feedback. And this is just a, effectively a CRD that's going to solve the problem of how do we start interfacing with runtime security policy and configuration in Kubernetes at runtime, not at deployment time, which is uh, substantially different than how OPA has uh, approached the problem here. Uh, next slide. Um, hold on, just one second. Um, can you go back to the roadmap slide? I just wanted to call her a couple things. So, uh, the performance improvements, um, as part of that, we were participating in Google Summer of Code, uh, and uh, through the CNCF, and uh, the student who participated in that uh, actually went through and wrote some tooling that allows us to actually measure the performance of the uh, Falco engine itself. 
And so that work is actually going to be very instrumental in helping us drive these performance improvements and actually using that tooling. And then also around the Cloud Native Security Hub, um, we also are starting to imagine this for a generic location for things like hot security policies, uh, rego files, and other things like that as well. We've talked a little bit about it with the broader community, and I think um, there's just some things that we need to clean up on our side before we try to open this up more. But the code is actually posted on GitHub and is out there, and we want to start trying to develop that in the open. You can go ahead and slide 33, Amy. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Jesse. And slide 33. Um, why incubation? Why do we uh, think we deserve incubation and why do we think we're ready to take it to the next level here? Um, I think primarily there's something to be said about keeping up with the momentum and growth of the project. We have a lot of folks interested in adopting Falco. Uh, there's a lot of folks that are currently reviewing Falco and one of the, uh, the bits of feedback we've gotten is a reluctancy to, to run it in production until we've graduated to the next stage. So in order to push ourselves and make the software as strong and as battle tested as we can, we would like to move it to the next stage to keep up uh, the momentum that we've already been developing over the last 12 months. Uh, furthermore, we have real end users who have real compliance uh, requirements. And again, we want to just continue to focus on promoting the software and making it as secure as possible and as uh, tested as possible. And in order for us to do that, we would like to move to uh, the incubation stage. Uh, we have a CNCF case study that we've been working on with Frame.io. We would absolutely love to get this published. We've been looking at uh, offering some literature on our end around it as well. And again, in order for us to do this, we need to be in incubation. Um, furthermore, we want to start pulling our build out of Cystic managed infrastructure into the open source ecosystem so that we can manage uh, our builds and our releases as an open source community. And we would love to leverage the CNCF here. Uh, again, moving the incubation would help out with this effort dramatically. Um, and last but not least, we want folks to be able to collaborate on the RPI with us as we start to figure out what exactly this means and how we're going to start proposing this to the uh, Kubernetes uh, upstream ecosystem. I think it's going to be helpful to have us uh, in the incubation stage as we look at implementing real-time solutions for folks running uh, in Kubernetes. Uh, and last but not least, there is a link to the proposal that Ducey put together for us if folks have any questions or would like to see the official um, TOC proposal that that we put together. Um, so yeah, I think that about wraps it up unless folks have, have any questions. Uh, I had one brief one. Uh, you mentioned that uh, your RPI approach was, was substantially different than, than Opus. Uh, could you just very briefly give us an idea of, of where the key difference is there? Uh, you kind of broke up at the end, but I think what you were trying to ask is uh, concretely, what is the difference between RPI and OPA? Correct. Yeah. In summary. Yeah. Yes. So basically, if you look at how OPA is implemented right now, uh, and this goes for Gatekeeper as well, it, it's every time you mutate an object in the Kubernetes uh, database is when we take action. Um, so this is different than how we would look at what we're calling runtime, which is a continual monitoring and auditing uh, throughout the course of an object's life, not just on create, update, delete. Okay. As, as far as I'm aware, uh, OPA can be used that way as well. Uh, I'm, I assume there might be a performance difference between the two approaches, but, but there are people using OPA for runtime enforcement. Interesting, okay. Okay, I think that's you know, a, a question more about RPI than it is about the actual incubation proposal, which um, uh, thank you for that. I think we're very thorough, covered an awful lot of uh, the, the points we might want to discuss, but uh, ah, <laughs> Chris has answered the question, which was how, where are we on the collision? So is it actually built, it's built into that uh, PR, is it? Yeah, um, and I, I think that's the question is, is what's in the PR? Is it sufficient um, for us to have a vote called? All right. Pending that there's no questions. Okay, so we'll need a TOC member to uh, uh, kind of take the lead on reviewing that. I'll, uh, I'll go through it and um, 
you know, we can uh, we can talk about it amongst ourselves. And so did this go through the SIG as well? Are we trying to formulate the, I know it was sandbox already. Should those sandbox projects that want to go to incubation first go through the security SIG? That is a great question. I think we should ask the SIG to take a look and give us their recommendation. Okay, uh, I can take an action item to follow up with the SIG here. Chris has just posted a link, which makes me think it's already been done. Okay, yeah, there is an assessment underway. Great. Unless we have any other questions. I, I was just curious who did the due diligence, if not the SIG? Is it in that link, Chris? A? I think that's why uh, we need a TSC member to, to review what's been put in there because I think that has been written by folks from Falco, right? Correct. That's, that's correct. Correct. So I think that's what Joe has volunteered himself for. Thank you, Joe. <laughs> All right. So shall we move on to Vitesse? Thank you very much, Marco people. This is uh, Sugu. Can you hear me? Yes. Hi, Sugu. All right. So uh, I am uh, supposed to be joined with uh, uh, two other people, but uh, uh, Yoon, uh, I think, said he may not be able to make it. So I'm Sugu. I'm the co-creator of uh, Vitesse. I'm joined with uh, Michael Demmer who is a principal engineer at Slack. And uh, if uh, Yoon, who is from uh, Square, uh, can't make it, I will uh, speak for uh, his slides. Um, so going forward, what is uh, Vitesse? Uh, Vitesse actually uh, has many descriptions. I, mean, I think the broadest one is that it's in the new SQL category. Some people call it a, uh, shard, uh, a sharding middleware. Some people call it an orchestration system. Uh, so uh, it solves a, a few problems. Uh, the big ones are, one is it solves the scalability problem. It is massively scalable while still uh, giving you a relational uh, uh, interface. Uh, it solves a high availability problem, which means that uh, you can generally comfortably run with tests with five nines of availability. And uh, last but not the least, least is that uh, it is uh, cloud native. Uh, the word cloud native uh, does get used loosely, so I will cover specifically uh, some uh, points about uh, what makes Vitesse cloud native. Uh, next slide. <clears throat> so these are uh, uh, some of the stats uh, about uh, Vitesse. Um, I think the, the uh, most significant one is uh, who are the adopters. Uh, but before going into that, uh, the, um, the thing about uh, something like Vitesse, which is a storage system, is actually uh, a really difficult uh, uh, software to conquer, mainly because uh, uh, companies that decide to uh, adopt a technology like this are making real uh, long commitment, like five, 10 or years, or even for the rest of the company's life kind of commitment. Uh, as compared to um, other software systems that are more easily uh, interchangeable. Like if you're using an analytic system, you can easily swap one for the other. Uh, same with tracing or any, um, um, like uh, if you're using Datadog, you can say, oh, I want to use signal effects. So those kinds of changes are relatively easy, but uh, to uh, change your core storage system uh, is uh, a much bigger commitment, which means that Companies take longer to make decisions to adopt a software like this, but once they make the decision, they also stick with it for uh, much longer. Uh, next slide. <clears throat> so uh, in that kind of environment, uh, it's exciting to see some really uh, impressive names of adopters in the Vites list. Um, uh, and uh, here another point is um, the way uh, saw, uh, storage adoption goes is 
everybody wants to know if there is somebody else uh, who has used this. And uh, so it kind of becomes a chicken and egg problem uh, to gain adoption in this, uh, in this area. So now Vitas has a pretty um, uh, impressive list of uh, adopters where, and also uh, in a wide range of uh, deployments. Uh, here you can, you can have, um, there are people who run on bare metal, there are people who run on public clouds, uh, both AWS and GCP uh, and Azure. Uh, there are uh, Kubernetes deployments. There is uh, actually somebody who is actually working on a Nomad deployment uh, also. So Vitesse uh, does show that it can run on a large number of uh, uh, platforms. Uh, uh, and I'm going to cover a couple of uh, uh, use cases here. Uh, next slide. Let's see if uh, Yoon has joined us. Uh, I don't see Yoon, so I'll speak on uh, his behalf. He gave me permission to say anything on his behalf, so I think I'm allowed to amplify. <laughs> so uh, Vitesse, uh, uh, Square has uh, been one of the early uh, adopters of uh, Vitesse, and they've been uh, participating in the project for uh, two or three years now. Uh, their Cash App now fully runs on Vitesse, and uh, uh, they started with one instance, but then they've now grown into a large number of shards and a pretty large data set and query volume. Uh, uh, while being involved in Vitesse, they also have an engineering team that contributes, of which three are actually uh, official Vitesse maintainers, which means that they can uh, uh, approve and merge uh, pull requests. And uh, they are also uh, growing their usage within uh, Square. Uh, their existing uh, systems are on bare metal, but all their newer clusters are being launched, uh, deployed on Kubernetes. Uh, next slide. <coughs> and uh, the next slide, actually, uh, I'm joined with uh, Michael Demmer, who is known as SF4531F. <laughs> uh, and he's going to talk about how uh, Slack is involved with with us. Yeah, thanks everyone. Um, like Sugo said, uh, my name is Mike Demmer. I'm one of the engineers here at Slack, and I was the lead on the project that um, brought Vitesse in as the choice for Slack's database solution. Uh, this is kind of a, um, a standard slide that we show just to kind of illustrate the growth that Slack has experienced over the last several years. Um, it's been kind of a great experience, but of course, uh, growth like this brings a bunch of stress on the infrastructure and in particular, the problem that I was looking at was how to make sure that we had a primary um, database storage platform that would sustain Slack's current and plans for future growth. Um, we were, uh, and well, we were very heavily invested in MySQL as our kind of data storage choice um, for the entire application. We had a bunch of code written that was expecting MySQL level semantics, uh, and we were running a kind of homegrown scale out sharded MySQL uh, system, we wanted to keep a bunch of those primitives in place, a bunch of our operational knowledge on how to run MySQL at scale, but um, bring in something to help us uh, both manage the instances and implement more flexible fine-grained sharding to uh, um, kind of handle some of our emergent and kind of evolutionary use cases beyond the kind of original model that we set the application out on. So starting in about uh, really in 2016 is when I started working at Slack, and then in kind of the middle of 2017 is when we uh, started rolling out the test into production. Uh, so if you go to the next slide, um, this is kind of the adoption curve as um, comparing our legacy MySQL solution with the test. Uh, the axis is deliberately obscured, but um, this is QPS kind of roughly aggregated. Um, so really just a measure of the amount of query volume that is going to the two systems. Uh, so as you can see, the aggregate query load goes up over time. Uh, that earlier slide indicates why. We're getting more usage from more users. Um, the share of the test has been steadily climbing as we've ported more and more application use cases over to it. Uh, we average at about 35% right now. Um, it's a little choppy. You know, We go through various states of um, bulk copying and backfilling jobs that kind of skew some of these metrics. But overall, uh, we've started to adopt more and more. Um, and Vitesse is really a tier one service in our reliability and kind of service posture um, where we're 
dependent on it, and we've been incredibly happy with its performance and its uh, reliability and its overall kind of operability. Uh, next slide just has a couple just other kind of key stats. Um, like I mentioned, we're about 35% migrated when it comes to our overall application usage. Uh, peak QPS on Vitesse is around 500,000 queries per second. Uh, total is about 10 billion queries per day. And adding the Vitesse middleware um, had a noticeable but non, um, kind of non-material impact in overall performance. Uh, because we are going through an extra hop to get between the application servers and the database, there's about an extra millisecond of latency on average. Um, in many cases, that's uh, amortized by the um, finer grain sharding, giving us better predictable performance at the MySQL layer itself. Um, but in any event, those are kind of the key metrics for our deployment. And then the final slide here, uh, just click one more. Um, we've been pretty heavy adopters of the project, both as users, but also as contributors. Um, so these are some just kind of call outs of PR titles that have been uh, primarily written by people from Slack. Uh, I'm not going to go through all of these, but um, from the very beginning days, we saw this as a project that would serve a lot of our needs out of the box, but where we had an opportunity to, and frankly, a need to, and then an opportunity to build upon the platform to suit Slack's needs and then um, kind of extend the applicability of the test beyond some of its original days at YouTube, but to fit more and more use cases. Um, so these have to do with both um, some reliability related things, some various query planner uh, features that we needed to add. Um, there's a query execution simulator engine that we built, um, a bunch of work on the kind of workflows for managing resharding at scale, um, really that we've uh, been able to build here internally and then contribute back to the community. Um, and so overall, we found it has to be a great platform to both um, build upon and also um, to kind of deploy out of the box for our use cases at SOC. Uh, so with that, I'll turn it back over to Suzu. Cool. Thanks, Demer. Uh, so there's, uh, uh, there's actually a case study that's about to be uh, published by Slack to uh, the CNCF uh, website that's coming out soon. And there's also an interesting talk that they are going to give at uh, the next KubeCon, where they uh, talk about how they treat their databases as cattle. Uh, so that's uh, pretty exciting to uh, to see that to hear that. Cool. So the, there's um, a couple of Kubernetes workloads that I wanted to highlight because of their significance. Uh, the Stitch Labs one is actually the most uh, exciting one. Uh, as you know, Kubernetes was released in 2015. And at that time, people were barely trying to figure out how to run even stateless workloads. But uh, because of Vitesse's background, uh, the fact that it could survive in Borg, um, uh, the Google's cloud, uh, not only because um, not only did it survive in Borg, it actually was deployed as if it was a stateless application, uh, which means that it knew how to deal with uh, ephemeral, ephemeral movement of um, uh, instances and loss of uh, the underlying data and survive that kind of environment. So we could confidently tell people that you can run with tests on Kubernetes as if it's a stateless application. And uh, Stitch Labs actually was the first one to uh, try this out. And they've been running on uh, Vitesse uh, since uh, 2016. Um, later, later HubSpot came and they said, oh, we are not interested in really the sharding capabilities of Vitesse. We just like the fact that you can orchestrate well with it. And they have hundreds of key spaces. And in the meantime, JD.com quietly just deployed uh, thousands of key spaces and tens of thousands of tablets in their Kubernetes environment. And then they told us that they did so, which is pretty exciting to hear. <clears throat> and Nozzle is actually, uh, I would say, kind of the poster child of uh, why you should use Kubernetes. They actually deployed Vitesse on Azure because they had uh, free credits and then at some point of time, uh, they got a better deal from um, uh, Google, and they migrated from Azure into uh, GKE in one hour completely. Um, so there's a talk by uh, Derek Perkins called the Gone in 60 Minutes uh, that he's going to talk about how they did this. Uh, next slide. So while all this is happening, uh, Kelsey has been uh, tweeting about being very, very careful about moving 
uh, storage to Kubernetes. These are his uh, tweets from actually last week. Uh, and uh, he talks about um, uh, using extreme caution if you want to run uh, uh, stateful workloads or databases uh, in Kubernetes. But at the same time, he says, uh, you can use orchestration uh, systems. In that case, it is uh, more safe to do so. Next slide. So to uh, highlight why, uh, I'll uh, talk about the Vitas architecture a little bit. I'll cover this quickly since we are we may be running out of time. Uh, but um, the three main um, um, ideologies of Vitas is uh, simplicity, loose coupling, and survivability. Uh, for simplicity, we said that we should not have too many layers in the system. So this is essentially a two-layer system where the app server connects to the stateless servers, which are VT gates, and then the stateless servers orchestrate into uh, uh, send queries down to different databases. Uh, the loose coupling comes from the fact that all these pieces uh, operate independent of each other, which is the reason why Vitas can scale massively uh, as far as I know, there are no known limits to Vitesse's scalability. And the third one is the survivability, which is uh, if uh, one of the pods go down, Vitesse quickly uh, promotes a new master and continues to operate uh, without interruption. And these are the areas where it is difficult to run a storage system uh, inside Kubernetes because uh, if a pod goes down, the local storage is wiped out. You cannot uh, get access to it. So you need to have good uh, uh, reparenting story, which Vitesse gives you. And uh, the other one is the um, uh, ability to inform the application of uh, reparenting, uh, which is really hard in a uh, Kubernetes system where everything is treated as uh, uh, one category, like a stateful set is all one, um, or replica set is all uh, one. It's difficult to single out a single pod um, in a system like that. So that is the uh, Vitesse architecture. Next slide. And there are some uh, alternatives that people have used uh, who have not chosen to use Vitesse. One is uh, the application managed sharding. At this point, uh, it is pretty much recommended that one uh, doesn't do it unless you've already done it before. Uh, so that is uh, one option. Uh, so other people have just been growing their uh, databases by buying more and more expensive hardware. And uh, there are some newer uh, new SQL systems like Cockroach, TiDB, uh, which is also uh, gaining a option. Next slide. Uh, these are uh, the other uh, uh, CNCF projects that uh, Vitesse uses. Uh, that's one scary looking Jaeger out there. Uh, next slide. So, I put a ribbon to make it look uh, less scary. Uh, uh, so the, uh, and uh, another uh, uh, name that keeps coming up is Envoy. Uh, typically, if Vitesse really scales out into thousands of shards, we may need to uh, bring in Envoy to actually consolidate some connections and uh, spread them out a little. So that's one project that we are looking at um, possibly adding uh, support for. Uh, next slide. And finally, this is the last slide. Uh, the maintainers team is now actually quite diverse. Uh, Slack and Square are major contributors, uh, but also uh, Pinterest and HubSpot and Nozzle. Nozzle actually contributed uh, the Helm charts. Uh, Pinterest has made uh, uh, many query contributions and HubSpot has added uh, uh, orchestration related contributions. And that's it, any questions? I think I, my main question would be, I, and seeing that maintainers team is, you know, very encouraging. I, I would be interested to know, you know, if Planet Scale were to uh, vanish, do do you have confidence that Vitesse would still have the uh, the maintainers and the expertise to keep the project going? Uh, <clears throat> that's a good question. Uh, um... I'll let Demer maybe uh, uh, talk about it, and then maybe I'll add what I think about uh, this. Um, so it is a good question. I think putting there is a bunch of institutional knowledge in um, a handful of people. So I think like many complex projects, 
Um, Sugu has a bunch of knowledge about areas of this that I think are, um, regardless of planet scale as a company, um, there are just a couple of key individuals with knowledge that we've learned some over time. Um, but with the kind of tenure and involvement, there's a bunch of backstory and history around why things are the way that they are that is sometimes not necessarily captured. Um, that said, there's areas of the code that I feel like I know the best that Raphael, who's on our team, knows the best. So I don't know that that's anything per se around planet scale, but um, it is not an enormous community of developers. Um, it's also not tiny either. So um, it's kind of a hard question to answer because it's a little bit hypothetical where we're coupling the existence of a company with the kind of continued involvement with a corpus of kind of key individuals. Uh, so. I don't know if that's a sufficiently dodgy answer for being put on the spot, but um, that's kind of the, the sentiment I have right now. Yeah, I think uh, to uh, qualify that statement at this point, uh, um, I have definitely made a lot of effort to disseminate what I know about Vitas to various uh, people. Uh, at this point, uh, I think every area of Vitas has at least uh, uh, almost every area of Vitas has at least uh, two people that can jump in and uh, uh, take care of. Uh, the only one, the last one that is left would be the query parsing. And uh, actually, um, uh, Andres Taylor from Square is now starting to ramp up on that area. So uh, we are um, basically striving for a bus factor of uh, greater than one. Uh, I don't know if that answers your question, uh, but it's more, basically we are focusing more on more than one person uh, knowing different areas of the software. Uh, not, we haven't really thought about distributing that across companies. I think bus factor is a very good way of putting it. Maybe we should be thinking about a process of <laughs> like defining what we mean by bus factor. Um, but yeah, that, I think that's a, an important aspect of making sure the project is mature to make sure that the bus factor is at least greater than one. <laughs> Do we have other questions out there? That seems like a no, in which case we've managed to get to the end of the presentations with you know four minutes to spare thank you very much everyone for uh, uh doing that in the meantime shang has volunteered to uh help with the due diligence so uh that will be the next step okay i think that's it for this for this week thank you very much everyone thank you Thanks. Thanks. Goodbye. Thank you.